Hey folks, happy Thursday. How's everybody doing today? Hope you're doing all right and found the, the right place to hang out. All right, close that down. Yeah, I'm not, not a big fan of Zoom and just staring at black boxes, so um, uh, I, I prefer to use this if, if that's all right with you folks. Um, so hopefully you're doing well. I just had to refill my coffee cup here, so I'm good to go. So hopefully you're here for uh, 1501, Computer Science 1 for Data Scientists. Uh, today's the course introduction, and I'm going to show you all the tools we're going to use. Now, we, we do have access to the lab. We'll be there on Mondays uh, for our lab sessions. Uh, the idea is I'm going to lecture Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'll show you a bunch of things, and then we get to try them all the following lab. Um, and we don't have lab on Labor Day, so that works out relatively well. It's not a whole lot going on today, uh, but I'm going to show you you can install the tools uh, for use at home. They're all free, which is fantastic. So let's go over the syllabus. And we'll look at some of those tools to install, and then next week we'll actually start getting into the material, the text, um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, again, this is a four-credit course here, so we're going to meet 3.30 to 4.45 or so. Um, we might not take up all our 15 minutes every single time, uh, depending on what we're covering. Um, and as we get nearer to the final project, uh, the goal is we, we can reserve a little bit of that final time to chat uh, as we work on that final project. Um, do some additional meetings, whatever we have to do there. Uh, but Mondays, 2 to 3.45, over in the HPEC building, uh, room 1190 is our lab. And do remember, masks are required on campus for everybody this semester. This is me. I'm Eric Chinesky. Hopefully you had a chance to Google me. Um, I'm, I'm the only one in the world that I know of. Um, so shouldn't be too hard to find some info about me. Uh, for office hours, I'm going to be doing those remotely. Uh, you know, we can meet before and after lab when we're on campus. Uh, if you want to be in person, I'm happy to do that with you folks. Uh, but other than that, um, we've got all sorts of remote tools, whether or not you like Zoom or Discord for screen shares. Um, all that's fine. Uh, this is, is my cell phone number. Um, I have a phone number for campus, but I have never used it ever in my six years of being here because um, it's just... It's at a desk somewhere, and I don't go there. So use my cell phone. Um, you're welcome to call and text. I'll, I'll go over some other contact info in just a minute uh, when times are good. Uh, essentially, I'm up usually by 8 in the morning or so. Uh, I got into computers specifically, so I didn't have to get up early in the morning. Um, and then I'm usually around up till midnight at, or so. Uh, so feel free to call or text anytime between 8 and midnight. Um, I mean, after that, you're welcome to text me. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, and if you call me... Between those hours, I'm just going to ignore it even harder. Um, but, you know, uh, you can always email, and then you can hang out in the Discord server. Hey, Ry Rygos, Rygogos. Yeah, doing well, thanks. Um, so you can also email here. The email does go to my phone. Uh, just one note, um, the Canvas email system, or like the inbox system here, goes to the non-priority inbox. So I don't usually get notifications on my phone. I'll still see it in my email, but it's not going to like notify or, or ping my phone uh, that I got a message. But if you send a direct email through your email client um, to my email address, it'll show up as a, an important message. I'll, I'll get it right away. Um, or Discord as well. Um, feel free to, to ping me in the, the, my Discord server or direct message me. Uh, again, I'm, if you have questions, um, I, I generally encourage you to put them in the general course channel there. That way everyone else gets the benefit because if you weren't sure about something, I'm pretty much guarantee someone else wasn't sure about that same thing. So by you asking the question and me answering it in that public chat room, uh, we get the benefit just as if you were in person in class, you asked a question and everyone heard your question and my answer. Uh, but you're always welcome to direct message me as well. So a couple of these program learning goals come from the data science program, because this is a course in the data science major. Um, not everyone who takes it is a data science major, though. I've had uh, a, a couple math majors come on through. I've had someone who was a physics major come on through the course before. Uh, occasionally get grad students doing an undergrad or uh, some programming prerequisites as they look to a master's program. Uh, Alright, you need paper? Yep. How many do you need? Is that enough? That is even too much. Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, Alright, you just take the rest of mine, please. Okay. Yep, ready. All right, uh, so the specific course objectives are specific to our 1501 course here. Uh, so throughout the course, we're going to do these things. Um, they probably don't make a whole lot of sense to 
go through right now because a lot of the words will make a lot of sense. There's a lot of uh, uh, jargon or, or technical terms in here that we haven't really talked about. So don't worry too much about it, but uh, throughout the semester, we'll kind of look back to these objectives and see, yeah, okay, we, we've learned these things. We're going to map to these tools and techniques um, to do these. And eventually we'll write small programs in Python. Um, this solves a data science problem is a little bit misleading. Um, it, we're not like solving any novel, unique problems. We're going to do some analysis. Uh, and that, that was, I mean, as far as we're going to get in your very first programming class, this is assumed to be your very first programming class. If you have prior program, programming experience in other languages, uh, you're probably going to be bored for a little while until we get into some more of the interesting stuff. So, hey, Crow. Yep. Uh, back at the home office here for the, the lecture portions of this class over at U of M Dearborn. All right, um, so our textbook here is actually an online interactive ebook. This one is super cool. They've got an amazing platform, and in general, it's cheaper than most other textbooks. A hat, you got it, Crow, my friend. And my chess bra hat right here. The original OG chess streamers. So I've been a, a fan of Twitch since before I started streaming on it. Um, I'm, I'm a giant nerd, um, and, and I've been watching several several channels uh, for a while. And actually, before the pandemic started, um, oh yeah, oh, I haven't seen Robin play in quite a while versus Eric Hansen for Chess Bra. But uh, before the pandemic started, I used to teach a evening course on C Sharp um, over here at Dearborn. And one of the students said, hey, Eric, you talk really fast. That's because I drink coffee um, all the time and I have six kids and uh, I'm busy. So I have all sorts of coffee in me all the time. So they said, would it be nice if you could record it? Your lectures. I said, okay, you know, we can do that. And I looked at it and they were like, oh, if I just broadcast on Twitch, it's like automatically recorded and you can watch the VODs. So I started doing that back in, I want to say 2018. It would have been the winter of 2018. Is that right? Maybe it was winter of 2019. Um, Twitch doesn't keep the history that long. Uh, but so I've been, I would broadcast uh, from in the classroom and that way also because you know it's michigan and michigan winters and night classes sometimes traffic is really bad and we have weather and, and i said well yeah sure if you don't want to come in that's fine just hang out on twitch uh, so when we moved to pandemic remote learning i said well let's just keep doing this twitch thing so the the only major downside that i see to it is there's no voice chat for you folks um I, no one has said that was a major hang up for them at all and i do have in my discord server i've got a, a voice chat channel called um, lecture voice chat. So if you prefer to ask me questions over voice, um, just let me know. I can hop in that channel. You can hop in that channel and then I'll be able to hear you. Um, and that should work out relatively well. The only downside is you're going to be about maybe six seconds behind or whatever the, the latency happens to be from broadcasting on Twitch. But I, I don't think a six second delay is going to be a big, a big, uh, deal breaker or anything, but that's an option if you'd like it, or if not, just hang out here and chat, um, chat me the questions and, or, or you even have the option of attending asynchronously if you want. I'll be taking all the lectures and exporting them out to YouTube so they stick around for more than 45 days, because Twitch will eventually take them down. Um, and the other cool thing about Twitch is I am officially a Twitch affiliate. Uh, enough people follow the channel, and I streamed often enough, and whatever that other requirement was. Um, so I'm eligible for um, Twitch subscriptions and bits and all sorts of things like that. And I don't want you to think I'm double dipping. I'm not taking any of the money that Twitch gives me. So I've got a little tracker on my channel. Um, I don't know if you can see if you just scroll down or maybe you have to see it when I'm offline. So anytime Twitch sends me money, I will donate it to the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Engineering and Computer Science Student Scholarship Fund. So, so far they've paid me one time, uh, but some students thought that was kind of cool. They could throw their you know um, Twitch Prime subscription or Twitch Gaming subscription, whatever they call it now. Uh, the, the free one out and then it would get turned into scholarship money. So that's an option. And again, I'm not double dipping. And actually I end up having to pay taxes on it as income, um, but that's okay. I don't mind. So it's, it's a good cause to donate to. Uh, so we're going to use this online ebook uh, called a Zybook. So you give it this code. I think it's uh, $77. So it's technically a rental because you'll lose access to it eventually, but there's an option to print the pages to a PDF. So you'll lose the interactive piece of it, but you'll then have a PDF of all the actual content itself there. So it should be not too big of a deal. Um, and, and it's got some really cool interactive features. So as it's showing you, hey, here's something you can do in code, you can actually start typing code in one of the windows right there and run it and see what happens. 
Um, they've got some occasionally frustrating, but really good uh, for learning attention to detail. Uh, they, they call them labs. It, it's essentially an, an, a miniature assignment right in the Zybook that says, okay, go do this thing. And when it's done, it, it should output these results and it will compare and tell you whether or not you've been successful. Uh, the, the downside is it is extremely specific. And if you have a single space in the wrong place, it's going to tell you you didn't do it right. Which is kind of frustrating, but it's good to learn like that level of attention to detail to say, okay, I will do exactly this output for this this given problem here. Uh, we're also going to make use of GitHub. GitHub is a hosting provider of Git repositories. So Git is essentially the industry standard source control tool nowadays. Uh, I think the last time I looked, we we're over like 75% of, of projects um, are using Git for source control when they do surveys of, of developers. Uh, so GitHub provides services to serve as a central repository that everyone can synchronize with. It's fantastic. Git's an amazing tool written by our friend Linus Torvald, uh, the founder of Linux, when he got tired of using the other source control tools and thought he could do better. And turns out he could. Um, Git is by far the best source control tool out there. So GitHub just happens to be someone who provides the service of hosting these central repositories. They've got a really cool website I'm going to show you, and then they have a really cool educational hookup for uh, classroom. It's, integration's the wrong word. Uh, it doesn't really integrate directly into Canvas, but it does a lot of really cool things that I'll show you uh, for setting up all the things that we're going to need. So we'll get into that uh, when we do our first lab assignment. Not this coming Monday, because it's Labor Day, but a week from Monday, we'll, we'll practice that. Um, we'll do these for all of our labs and then all of our projects as well will be done. Um, so you don't need to upload anything to Canvas. You don't need to email me attachments. You don't need to send me your code at all because Git is a source control tool made for code collaboration. We're going to take advantage of that. You'll be putting your code out on github.com in a private repository that you'll have access to and I'll have access to. And that's it. So I'll be able to see your code and you'll be able to see your code uh, and we can look at it from there really saves on all the irritation with attachments and whatnot. Uh, we're going to use Python uh, version 3.x, whatever the latest version is. I, I think it's 3.8. Um, you just go to python.org. There's a, a quick little download and installer for it. Oh, 3.9. Yep, 3.9. My goodness, I don't know what happened to 2020. Um, that year just didn't happen. Yeah, so we're on 3.9. And any of the previous three versions will work. Uh, version 2 is relatively different from version 3. There was a big split a while ago, um, so we've done everything in version 3 since, and so that we don't lose this end-of-life support, um, and it's going to have all sorts of trouble here where it's not really supported anymore. So don't use version 2. So anything 3 should be fine, but the latest and greatest will have security and bug fixes and all the good stuff that you need. So we'll download and install that. Um, it's free install. The, the lab computers will have it, but at home you just download and run. It's nice and easy. And then we'll use Python. So that's the language, and then we're going to use an integrated development environment. That's an IDE. Um, particularly, we're going to use the one PyCharm. If you've done some Python programming before and you have a different IDE that you like, um, you're welcome to stick with it. Uh, I'm not familiar with all of them, but I, I do know several um, IDEs for Python, and most of them will do the things that we need. Um, a little bit later on, we're going to get into more of the computer science end of things and talk about classes and how Python is an object-oriented language and write unit tests. PyCharm is really good at those, and not all the IDEs are as good. Um, so just, just keep that in the back of your head that you might need to switch to PyCharm at some point if you want to take advantage of some of those tools. Um, all right, those are the tools we're going to use. Uh, the PyCharm, there's a community edition. That's the free one. Use that one. Um, that you, can, you can go and download and install. You don't need to get the paid version. Right? Just use the free one. So when you go to download, it says, hey, which version do you want? We want the community version here. We don't need the full-fledged professional, right? So skip the professional one. You don't need, the, I mean, it's a free trial, but it's obnoxious. Just do community. All right. Yes, we agree. How cute is that little pop-up? Looks like a terminal. All right. Cool. So those are the tools we're going to use. Um, I actually do need to update my PyCharm. That's it's a, a little bit old. I'm going to go download the latest version because it's been a little while. So I'll refresh my tools uh, and we'll be in good shape. So you can install them on your personal computer. 
the lab should have them already installed. And if they don't, they actually both will install without admin permissions, which is really nice. Um, and then in addition to the GitHub account, I, I guess I forgot the link here, or it will take you through it eventually. You're going to install the GitHub desktop client. Uh, I'll talk you through this all in lab. Don't worry too much about it. It's desktop.github.com. Um, and it's a little client that we're going to use to do all the process. So our, our very first lab, once we get there, uh, we'll do all of this to make sure we, we know the process and we got it down and life will be good. Because um, once we've done it once in lab, we're going to do it for every lab and we're going to do it for every project and assignment. Um, so uh, the things people can seem to care about is how you get your grade in the course. So I use a weighted system so that each category contributes to this percentage of your overall final score. So the points within the categories only matter within the categories. So if a lab is worth 10 points and a project is worth 10 points, the points only matter within their category. So projects overall will make up 25% of your overall score. Um, most people do really well in the projects. Uh, the goal is you get them 100% complete, right? And I'm happy to answer questions, get you pointed in the right direction. Obviously, I won't write it for you, uh, but if you get stuck on anything, uh, I, I typically ask you at least try for a good half hour to hour of figuring out what you're stuck on yourself, um, and then come ask me. I've had people say, oh, I spent, you know, all day long, I was working for hours and hours and hours and made no progress because I was stuck on something. And when I look at it, it's like two minutes to fix it. And I get them pointed in the right direction. And then they've just had a terrible day, wasted eight hours. They're mad at the project. They're mad at me. They're mad at themselves. And it makes everyone miserable. So at least a good half hour to an hour trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then come ask me. Right? Uh, anybody can grab a Python book and, and start it themselves. Um, you're taking a college course here so that I'm here to help you learn it. Um, so projects 25%, everyone should get full credit on all of them. Right? We just need to put the work in. Um, a single exam in the course is just a midterm. Um, we'll do this one in the lab, um, so it'll be a timed exam. Uh, it shouldn't be a lot of stress. I, I know exams are typically terrible, and I hate them myself. Um, the exams are open book, open notes, open internet. Um, as a software developer, I get paid a lot of money, and I've never had anyone ever ask me to do something from memory and say, oh, don't, don't look it up. Don't look at any references. Don't use any sources. Don't look online. Don't use any of your reference books. You have to do it off the top of your head because that'd be stupid, right? You're not going to get as good of a product. So I don't expect you guys to memorize anything. What I expect is that you know where to go find more information and how to go find it. So everything we do, that the main reference is going to be our Zybook textbook here. Um, and then additional, a couple of the things I'll talk about in lecture time as well. So anything I say and anything out of the book is fair game for tests and quizzes. Um, so the quizzes uh, are not time bound. They do have a due date, uh, but we're going to have a quiz over every chapter. And this is your incentive to actually read the Zybook, right? And not just do the activities in the Zybook. I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, but actually read it. So we'll have a quiz for every chapter. Um, they're open book, open notes, open internet. There's no time limit on it aside from the due date. So you can start it, you can save it, you can come back to it anytime you want. Um, the Zybook itself is really cool. Um, actually, is that link? That link's good, right? Forgot to double check that link. I know they, they changed their one website. Okay, good. That's loading. So I've got my book here. And what's really cool is that every section here is going to track your progress. And not track it in a weird, creepy way. Like it's not Big Brother. We're, we're monitoring, trying to find out what you're doing here or not. But as you go through it, um, it'll have a little checkbox for, yes, I've done this section and I've done the activities in it. And I can run a report to say, hey, how much of this did you actually do? And then when it comes to the labs, these little exercises that you're going to do, you get points for doing them. Right? So by reading the book and actually practicing what the book is having us do, you get another 10% of your grade. So this is should also be free points. All you have to do is do it. Right? Essentially participation points for, for reading the book, which is super cool. Um, but it, it's a really good practice tool. Um, I, I've had generally good feedback of the Zybook that people seem to think it works out really well instead of a traditional textbook that's just really boring to read. Uh, this is nice and interactive and, and lets you practice it right away. So 10% of your score from the Zybooks, 10% of your score from the quizzes, 10% of your score from the lab assignments. These are the labs we do on Mondays with me, not the labs in Zybook. Right? Zybook is its own thing. It, they call them labs, but they're Zybook labs, not our Monday labs. So sorry if the terms are a little confusing there. 
We'll have the single midterm exam, it's 20% 20, 20 of your overall score, and then a final project we're going to do uh, makes up another 25% of your overall score. So in terms of things you're going to do at home, right, with basically unlimited time, it's projects, the final project, my books, quizzes, uh, and labs, they're not due until the week after. So if we have a lab on Monday, it's going to be due the next Monday. So again, it's mostly unlimited time on it. It's, it's not like, hey, you have to have it done in that hour and 45 minutes that we sit in the lab. So 80% of your score is going to come from stuff that you have mostly unlimited time on. And, and I know you folks are busy and have other things and other classes and whatever else is going on in your lives. So it's not unlimited, but it's not, hey, you have to sit here and get this done in two hours or you fail. Uh, so the, the goal is it's low stress there. Um, for the grading scale, this should be standard, right? If there's a particular letter you're looking for, for a, a GPA or whatever you need. Um, I, I do recommend, um, if you haven't heard it before, you want to stay above a 3.0 and even better above a 3.5 when applying for internships. So just because some large companies are crappy, um, and that's, they have to do something to filter all the applications for internships that they get, um, one of the most common filters they have is that if your GPA isn't above a 3.0 or maybe even a 3.5, depending on the organization, they won't even consider you for the internship. So as we're looking later on down your, your college career here, um, internships are phenomenal. They're a great experience. Uh, they get you networking. You get to meet some people. Um, and generally they pay, I mean, not well, but they pay decently when it comes to programming internships. Um, so you'll want to make sure you're, you're keeping a good GPA just to make sure you don't get dropped accidentally by one of those filters. And it's not a great filter. I don't advocate for it. I don't, I don't have that sort of thing um, when we look for interns. But um, you know, companies have to do something. So I, I can see where they're coming from with it. Anyway, so that's the, the grading scale. So our tentative course outline, it is subject to change if we need to. Uh, but this is the, the current plan. Um, I only have the lecture dates in here. I don't have the lab dates. So the idea is the lab will be the Monday after. So this is a Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday. The lab on Monday will be a lab practicing the stuff from the week before. So we don't have a lab on Labor Day, but then we're going to have week two, uh, September 7th, September 9th. We'll have the lab on September 13th practicing all of this stuff from Zybooks Chapter 1. And then we'll cover chapter two in the textbook. And then the next week we'll have the lab and then two lectures, lab and two lectures. So it is three days a week. Uh, if you're doing this stuff asynchronously, that's perfectly fine. Uh, just make sure you keep up because the way that this works is everything builds on itself. So you can't really do chapter three until you've done chapter two. And you can't do chapter five until you've done chapter four, three, two, and one, right? So it, it's very building upon the foundation as we learn all these tools and techniques in programming. Um, so we're going to get all the way through chapter seven strings. Um, so eight weeks, essentially, of class here. And then on 1021, I have plans that will be just a midterm review. So I'll give you last year's midterm. Um, you're welcome to, we'll, we'll use that as practice, essentially. And then we'll go over it. So I'll post it ahead of time so you guys get a chance to practice it. Um, and then during the review, we'll, we'll go over the answers to it. And then the plan is to do the midterm during the lab time. So, there's, I mean, strings are great, but we're not going to do a lab just on strings. Um, that's okay. We're going to do a midterm instead on 1025. So the plan is to do that one in the lab. Again, open book, open notes. Um, but this one will have a time limit on it. So once you click start, you'll have to submit within uh, two hours for, for that midterm. Again, it's not meant to be stressful, but I know anything that has a, t a timer on it tends to be like that. Uh, so we'll do lots of practice. Hey, my Nick, how are you doing today? Happy Thursday. All right. Are things looking? I think my connection has been pretty stable. Um, Comcast has been pretty good recently. I had some troubles. Summer was great, I think, but uh, last winter was a little rough with Comcast. All right. Uh, we get to the midterm, and then we'll finish out. Um, we have two chapters. We'll get to exceptions and modules. They're both quick, uh, so we'll double up there. We'll get to files. We'll have a Thanksgiving break. We're off that whole week. So we'll do a files lab the Monday on 11.29, because there was no lab on, I think the, the whole college just closed that entire week for Thanksgiving, which is cool. Um, so we're off, and then we'll pick up inheritance recursion. Uh, inheritance is a topic, and recursion is a topic we'll cover deeper if you continue on in the data science program with CIS 2001. So this is essentially a two-course track, um, computer science one, computer science two. 
we teach it in Python for data science students. It's taught in C++ for our computer science students. Um, so the 150 or 1, 150 course and 200 courses are the C++ courses here in CIS. And 1501 and 201 or 2001 um, are the Python versions of those courses for our data science majors. So inheritance and recursion are topics we'll pick up deeper in the next course. But we want to cover them at least briefly um, to get you an intro. And not everyone does continue on for the second course either. So some people are just taking just this one here, uh, whether or not they're a math major, physics, or just want to learn some Python, um, have a fun elective. And then we'll get to plotting and some really, really basic graphics. It's it's literally like one section, um, one page in Zybooks here is this chapter 16. There's not a lot there, but I want to show you what we can do with it. Uh, you can do a lot of really cool things. So everything up till plotting and graphics is all console based. There are no buttons to click. There's no user interface for us to interact with. It's all just going to show up on the screen as text. Um, and it's kind of boring, but that's okay. We, we, it's easier to start there than it is to start trying to build out graphical things. Um, and then I don't actually know when the date of our final exam is. They don't have the final exam schedule. So I picked the last day possible um, and said final projects will be due at 6 p.m. that day. Um, the goal is uh, for us to meet, but I don't know what time we're going to meet yet because I don't have that slot. Um, so once they tell us what slot we're going to be in, um, I, I can have a meeting time there. Um, and what I would like for us to do is to get together and present our final projects. So we'll do a little data analysis thing, do some plotting, uh, which is a lot of fun to show off our results. So last semester, if you had a chance to join the Discord server and look and see, uh, we did a little analysis of war. So we, we did a simulation to build out the game of, of war, the card game, war, and then we ran it with various um, different inputs. We said, okay, well, what if we have this many cards in the deck? What if we have this many cards or this many cards um, to see, you know, is there some sort of correlation between the number of decks that you have and the number of turns that it takes to finish a game? Because uh, I tell you, when I play with my kids, it seems like it takes a thousand turns before you finish war. But when we ran the numbers, it was a lot closer to, uh, I think it was like only 200 turns maybe 250, 280 turns maybe, to finish a, a game of war with a single deck of cards. Uh, and that was just kind of interesting. And that's about as cool of data analysis as we can do with a single semester of programming. In 2001, we do a little bit more interesting stuff. Uh, that was a lot of fun. We'll do that in the winter semester if you're going to continue on. All right, so that's the tentative course schedule uh, for some course or uh, policies. So one specific to this course is the academic integrity policy. Um, don't share code, right? That's plagiarism, right? Presenting someone else's work as yours without citation is plagiarism. And even if you cite your source and say, hey, hey, I got it from Susie, it's still not cool, right? You, you can't just turn in someone else's thing with your name on it, even if you've properly cited your source. That, that's just not okay. Um, so if they look too similar, I'll ask you about it and say, you know, why, why do they look so similar? Um, when people write code, it generally, they, they have their own style. Now, a lot of people will adopt similar styles, but it's really hard to accidentally have identical code. Really, really hard. I've been doing this for many, many, many years, and it's never happened where it was an accident that two people wrote the exact same thing. I've never seen it happen. Um, so if you are guilty of an academic integrity violation, it goes to the dean's office. Uh, the Academic Code of Conduct Committee, they keep track of all that sort of thing, have a three-strike policy here at the university across all the colleges. Um, and after three strikes, you will no longer be welcome as a student here. You will be expelled. Uh, we do take cheating very seriously. And people who cheat should not get degrees. Um, and, and honestly, it's in your own best interest, too, to not encourage your classmates to cheat or help them with it. Because if they go and get a degree and they get hired somewhere and they don't actually know anything because they cheated their way through school that employer is going to think we do a terrible job here at U of M Dearborn educating people and they won't want to hire other U of M Dearborn graduates. So it, it devalues the degree for everybody because it just makes us look stupid. So don't cheat. Um, you can't supply code. You can't take code. Um, don't plagiarize. So don't turn in someone else's work as your own. And I, I used to think this would like would make a lot of sense and people would know, uh, but I've added this additionally in here. Um, under no circumstances may Chegg.com be used. Oh, I missed the word be used. Don't post questions there. Don't cite answers posted there. Any use of Chegg.com or similar websites like Course Hero or some of the other nonsense sites is considered a violation of the academic integrity policy. 
So don't post my assignments there. Don't post my labs there. Don't post the projects there. And don't go to check.com and cite it as a source, right? I know I'm not stupid. I know there's a website called Stack Overflow where there's all sorts of code out there on Stack Overflow, right? You can't post your assignment, ask someone else to do it, and then come back and say, oh, here's the site. Here, I found an answer online. Here's my, here's my citation for it, right? My goal when I come up with the assignments is to come up with one you can't Google an answer for, right? Because that, that would defeat the whole purpose. So I, I'm trying to Google these things. I do a decent job at it, making sure I don't see any existing answers. Um, so, But if you go out online and you say, oh, I needed to know how to find a prime number, and you find something on Stack Overflow, oh, here's how you find a prime number, and you use that bit of code, I'm okay with you citing that source. Like, hey, part of this, the problem I was supposed to do had to deal with prime numbers. Here's where I found how to find out a prime number. That's fine. Right? I'm okay with that. Um, you cited your source, just like when you write an English paper. You've put in a citation. We're okay. But the idea is that it was a small portion of the actual assignment. It wasn't, here's the entire assignment. I'm just, here's, I cited my source. No, here's a small piece that I used to build the rest of the assignment, and there's my original work in here as well. Um, so I do take this very seriously. It's a big pet peeve of mine. Um, it's a big pain to fill out the paperwork to fail people. Um, so the, the penalty in this course is immediate failure in the class. There are no second chances. There are no, you get a zero on the assignment. There are no try agains. There are no, oops, I didn't mean to. Um, you fail the class, right? You, you, you just will not cheat and pass my class if I can help it. Um, and then the paperwork I have to fill out for the dean is so obnoxious. It's the big form I have to fill out. I have to attach all these things. I have to say, here's the policy of my syllabus. Um, you're going to actually have a quiz on the syllabus, which is silly, but it's like, it's free points, essentially, making sure you read it. And then it will ask, do you understand the academic integrity policy and understand that if you cheat, you will fail the class? And um, you'll agree to that. And I've turned that into. Oh, that's cool. Software and game development. I didn't know that was a new category. I should check that out. I've just been streaming in science and tech for forever, Karmic. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, in terms of projects and homework being late, I don't take things late uh, without prior written approval. So like, if something comes up and you let me know ahead of time, I'm going to do my best to work with you. Uh, but aside from that, please plan ahead. Right? You, everything is generally has at least a week to do. The project will have at least two weeks to work on. Uh, so we're going to have time to get these things done. So just please plan accordingly. This is a college class. You're expected to to know how to plan and, and work out a schedule here so that you don't fall behind. Um, and then if you do start falling behind, it's even harder because everything builds on the chapter before and builds on the chapter before and builds on the chapter before. So if you're not caught up and I'm talking about new stuff, it's not going to make any sense at all. You're just going to get further and further and further behind. So don't, don't plan to turn things in late. No projects, no homework, no labs, no quizzes, nothing in late, please. Um, the, the goal is you keep up. Right? We have a pace for a reason. Um, there's information about the student food pantry. Uh, they're happy to, to help anybody who needs assistance there. I think the phone number still works. I, I believe they're back in the office now, but email is probably easiest uh, to get in touch with them. Hey, Blowfish, how are you doing today? The Vedic method of finding a square root. Honestly, I'd have to Google that one. Um, is that is that the new one uh, where he's like, oh, hey, he's going to teach it. And it's going to be so much easier for everyone to know. I forget. And then other university-wide policies, you can find out here in Canvas under policies for the academic uh, university attendance policy, academic integrity policy, counseling, disability services, safety, um, and harassment, sexual violence, bias, and discrimination. Oh, it's the older one, Blowfish. Okay, I thought I thought the new guy got one named after him, but that's cool. No, I'm, I'm used to the quadratic. Oh, no, that's not finding square roots. Shoot, okay, finding a square root. I read it wrong. I don't know how to read Blowfish. All right, so that's it for the syllabus here. So I'm going to show you, I've got PyCharm. Again, I'm going to go refresh and uh, restart here and get everything up to date with the latest versions in a little bit. I didn't get a chance to before class. I didn't realize how far behind my versions were. Um, but I want to show you real quick um, what we're going to do for our first lab, essentially. Um, someone had this idea a long time ago. I don't know who first started it. Uh, but anytime you go to learn to program or learn a new language, the first thing you do is make the computer say, hello world. Uh, and, and now it's just a tradition. So we do it all the time. So that's our very first project. And in Python, it is super, super simple. I'll show you. It's just going to take one line. It's really nice. I just need to get PyCharm to load here.
right? And then actually, I'm going to put, um, I didn't do this ahead of time, I'm sorry. I'm going to have a public course repository. So all the code that I do in lectures, all the examples that I do are going to go online here. So I've got my previous one out here. Um, it's, it's somewhere on this list. Um, Akiro, are you fine with us going faster in Zybooks than what the syllabus wants us to be at? Such so two chapters going. No, that's perfectly fine. If you want to go ahead, fantastic. Uh, totally at, at your pace there. Um, but don't go slower than the schedule. <laughs> uh, you should be fine there. So I'm going to make a new repository for myself. So all the code I do will be out there. Um, let me go make a repository real quick. And it, it'll be publicly accessible here on github.com. I'll show you how that works. Come on. New, there we go. So this will be CIS 1501, fall 2021. So it'll be a public repository. I'm going to add a little readme file. So it uh, just uh, gives me a little text at the front page. This git ignore is super important in git. This tells git what files you don't need to include. Um, so I'm going to go and pick Python here. It has a built-in template, so it knows, hey, I can skip these certain files. And I'm going to put a license on mine. You don't have any licenses on yours. That's fine. But I think, is it the... The MIT license is nice and easy. Um, should do everything I need here. I'll make a repository. Now, what happens with Git and GitHub is it's essentially a glorified file watcher. So this is the view of README. So README is a markdown file. So it just puts some a nice looking page here when you're viewing the repository online. So it's github.com slash slash CIS 1501 fall 2021. And I'll put that link out here in um, Canvas as, as well for you here. So you can always reference that. So I'm not going to put code in Canvas because Canvas is not meant for code. Right? Code is meant for source control tools like github.com. So let's do a link. This is our course repository. Definitely want that in the new tab. Um, and I always forget, I'm sorry, um, Canvas likes to be helpful. And when you add new stuff, it doesn't publish it. So someone told me a little little while ago, hey, Eric, you're dumb. You didn't publish the syllabus, so I can't actually read it. No, they didn't say it like that. They were much nicer um, using super polite words because you, you, you folks are fantastic. Um, but sometimes I'll forget to hit the publish. So if you don't see something that you think should be out there, just let me know. Um, I, I, I'm bad at using the student view button. Um, they, they, I should click that and make sure I can see it in the student view. But like I always see the stuff, even if it's published or not, on my view. I forget I need to go check student view. So I'll go make sure it's out there. So that's the course repository. So it's essentially a glorified file watcher. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it with the GitHub desktop client. And again, don't worry. We're going to go do all of this in our lab, not next Monday, because that's Labor Day. Hopefully you have a good holiday. Take some time off. Uh, but the Monday after that, we'll actually sit down in person in the lab. We can go through all these steps. I can walk around and help you folks out. Um, so we're going to open it with GitHub Desktop. The GitHub Desktop is the client that we use to communicate with GitHub.com. Should open up here. And great, I'm going to clone that repository. So clone is gives you a copy of the repository. So Git is a distributed source control tool. That means everybody has a copy of everything. So it's distributed across everybody. Other source control tools take a different model and a different approach to that. But Git is a distributed tool. So you have a clone of the repository. Now, two really helpful shortcuts here are, as soon as this finishes loading, repository view on GitHub. So if you want to go back to the GitHub website, you can just click view on GitHub and it'll open it back up. Oh, thank you so much for the stretch reminder. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I ended up, my home office here uh, used to be one of my kids' bedrooms. Um, so I had, I had this really cool loft bed with a desk on it. And we, we had to move everything around when we went fully uh, remote pandemic stuff because going down to the basement every time for my little basement office was, was not great, especially in the winter when it's really cold down there. <laughs> so I'm up on the second floor right now in my house. Um, so it's a little bright behind me. Nope, oh, that one. Yeah, that, that hand. <laughs> um so it opened in Git desktop. So again, repository view on GitHub will just open up the GitHub page again. So you can always go find it really easy online. The other really helpful link here is repository show and explorer. Show and explorer is going to open up my file explorer view and I can actually see the folder itself with all the contents. Now in Windows land, um, I'm, I'm a Windows fanboy, Microsoft fanboy. All this stuff will work on Mac, no problem. 
but I don't have a Mac, and I, I think Apple is just snobby and obnoxious. But that's just a personal opinion. Uh, so in Windows, you want to make sure you go to View and have File Name Extensions and Hidden Items checked. You want to be able to see these things, especially when we're doing development. It's, it's really nice to see those that sort of information. So if you have that, you'll notice there's a folder called .git. That's a hidden folder. This is where all the Git magic happens. Don't ever touch it. You know, just, just leave it alone. Let it do its thing. It's all good. There's a git ignore file. This one is telling git don't include for certain types of files here. Hydration Canada is it Italy? Um, I hear coffee is not actually hydrating because of the caffeine in it, uh, but it's essentially water, right? So I'm, I'm going to go with coffee for hydration. And a triple. Thank you. All right, one more. Thank you. That was good. All right. Although I'm out now, I'm going to have to go get more. Uh, there's a license file because I picked a license. And then there's that readme MD. So essentially, all that Git repository is, is a folder. It's just a folder here. And the default location is your users, documents. They make a folder called GitHub. And each repository gets its own folder based on the name of the repository. So ours is called CIS1501-Fall 2021. There's a folder on my computer now. Anything I put in here, like if I just right-click and say, hey, I want a new text file, and I call it like test.txt, and maybe I'll open it up and we'll put in here, hi there. I'll save and close it. Now, if I come back to my GitHub client, it's going to say, hey, there's something here. The Git client, what it does is watch that folder for changes. It watches it for new files. It watches it for deleted files. It watches it for files that have changed, and it will track it. So how it tracks it is with something called a snapshot or I'm sorry, not a snapshot, it's called a commit. A commit is a snapshot of the folder at that point in time. So over in this bottom left section here, I have a commit, you, you have a commit summary, which is required. So I'll say this is made test.txt file. The different organizations have different standards or conventions around what needs to go in here. Honestly, it doesn't matter. You just have to have something there. Um, and this message will show on github.com when we're looking at our repository. So generally, more meaningful is better, but you don't need to give me an essay, right? Just a, a quick summary. You, if you want to put an essay in, you can put it in the description section. I'm never going to look at it, so totally up to you. So I'm going to hit commit. A commit, then, is that snapshot. It says, okay, here's what the folder looked like. Here's all the files, here's all the contents at this point in time. Now, my version, my clone of the repository has that, but github.com as the central repository or the origin repository doesn't have that. So the idea with, with Git is you will push to the central repository and you can pull changes from the central repository down to your computer. Now Git was designed for, for teams to work together as a distributed source control tool so multiple people could collaborate on code. We're not doing any collaboration but that's okay we can still use a source control tool. So we'll probably never have to pull any changes. Everything we can we'll just make our commits locally and push out. Make our commits locally and push out. Um, if you're going to work on more than one computer, we will have to do some pulling. So if you want to use the computers in the lab on Mondays, we'll need to push and pull from there. And then on your personal computers, you can push and pull as well to make sure we stay in sync. Because the idea is we synchronize between my copy and the central copy. And everyone does that process in this distributed fashion. Uh, you're also welcome, if you have a laptop, to bring the laptop to labs on Mondays. Um, def definitely welcome to do that. You don't have to use the college computers if you don't want to. All right, so I'm going to click push. Now, pushing then will do that synchronization process. It's going to take my local changes and make sure they get out to github.com. So now if I come back to my GitHub page and I hit refresh here, I'm going to see here's a test.txt file, and I see my commit message here, that summary, made test.txt file. Now, files can actually be clicked on. They're links. So test.txt, if I click on it, I can actually view the contents of the file here right on github.com. This is one of the reasons they're a fantastic tool because I can actually view all of my code and all my files right here on the website. I don't, I don't need to clone it down locally and open it up in my tools. I can just do it online for a quick view. Okay, so again, a test file is not all that interesting, but what we're gonna do in PyCharm um, is, oh, I don't need that one. Uh, let me close that project down. Close the project. So PyCharm has this idea of projects. Oh goodness, it, it, okay, there we go, there we go. PyCharm. So, we're going to make projects in PyCharm, and each project is essentially its own folder. So project is just a way of organizing our code here in PyCharm. 
So what I want to do is I want to make sure I put it inside of that folder. So I'm going to go to Browse here, and I'm going to find my CIS1501 folder inside of my GitHub folder. So this is in C, it's the C drive, it's my users folder, it's Eric C is my username, inside of the documents folder, inside of the folder named GitHub, I find CIS1501-fall2021. I'm going to say, hey, please make a project inside of this directory. This is my new project here. Okay. Then I want to typically use this existing interpreter. It's going to make life easy for me here. I'll say, hey, use this Python version. Again, probably have 3.9 at this point, but it should just come up. Oh, hey, use this Python version. It's fantastic. We're good to go here. So we want to put everything inside of this folder here. But now what I'm missing is the name of the project. So I said put it in this folder here but I didn't give it a name. So I'm going to add another slash here. I'm going to call this one hello world. So it's going inside this folder and it's going to make another hello world folder for me. Because this will help keep me keep everything organized. So each lab that we do will be a project. Each project or assignment will be its own PyCharm project. Um, every time I do examples in class, I'll use a new PyCharm project just to keep things organized. Right, and then create a main.py welcome script is going to let PyCharm do a bunch of work for us already. It's fantastic. That way we don't have to type anything. So all these settings are great. Again, we'll go through this on Monday in lab. Not this Monday, not Labor Day, but the Monday after. And every class, um, every lecture, I'll do a new project. Um, or at least every week, I'll do a new project for the new content uh, to keep things organized week by week by week here. Uh, virtual environments are really cool. Uh, using these environments, they help you keep your Python install a little bit separate, uh, so you can do some funky things with it. We're not really going to bother with that at all. So we can just use the existing standard Python 3.7 install. We should be good to go. So we're going to hit create now, and it's going to make a bunch of files here, because PyCharm uses some other files for itself to keep track of things. And if I come back to my GitHub client now, it's going to say, oh, hey, there's a folder called hello world. Inside of that folder, there's a main.py file. There's also a .idea folder. Uh, that's for PyCharm. .ideas and then their workspace XML. If this changes, that's perfectly fine. Just let it change. It tracks a couple things here. It actually like knows where you were inside the file, which file was open, that sort of fun stuff. Uh, but what we really care about is the code file. So again, I'm gonna give it a little commit summary here. I'll say this is uh, hello world project created. It's going to create a snapshot of my folder at this point in time. Let's say commit. Oh, here's a bunch of new stuff. There we go. I Maybe mean, I didn't save it quite all the way. Okay, so here's a bunch of other idea files. Anything that's in .idea, perfectly fine. Go for it. Just let, let it let it show up there. So here's more idea files. Now commit those. There we go. And now I can push. So this will, again, will synchronize it with the github.com site. When I refresh here, now I'm going to see there's a folder called Hello World. Now I can click to open the folder, and I can view what's inside of it. I'll see there's the .idea folder. Again, we don't care about that. We care about the main.py. So py for Python, .py. It doesn't have to be named .py. Uh, that's just it, file extensions or conventions so that our computer knows, hey, this is a Python file. Perfectly fine. And I can open it up. I can see things line by line by line. So it's a little small there. I can zoom in a little bit for you here. Uh, again, none of this really makes a whole lot of sense right now. That's okay. Don't worry about it. And we'll get there later. But I can see all the code. So if you folks are doing the same process, I'll be able to see your code online and you'll be able to see your code online. Now, what's going to be a little bit different, um, and I'll show you that when we do our, our lab, is I'm going to give you a link through this thing called GitHub Classrooms which will automatically make the repository for you and make it private and make sure I have access and you have access. Saves me a whole bunch of work, right? I used to have to set these things up um, manually is, is maybe the wrong term there, but I, I have a script I would run to do all this sort of stuff, uh, but it saves me from doing all that. So the GitHub Classroom option is fantastic. So each project will have its own repository. It's really cool. Each lab will have its own repository. Um, so life will be really nice and easy for us and keep things separate uh, for us reviewing that way. All right, so back in PyCharm here, we see a bunch of stuff. Now, I think I can zoom that. Yep. Enhance a little bit here for you. Enhance, enhance, enhance. So it's telling you, hey, here's a sample Python script. Press Shift F10 to execute it or replace it with your code. Double Shift to search everywhere for classes, files, tools, yada, yada, yada. We don't really care about most of this stuff here. I'm actually going to delete all of it because 
it's nice that I created the file for us, but I don't need any of that starter code. So for us to do hello world, we're going to say print and then a set of parentheses. Notice print turns purple. So PyCharm recognizes, hey, this is a Python command. I say print and then I'm going to give it a apostrophe or a quote. Either one is fine. We'll talk more about the difference in a, uh, as we move on. Um, generally in Python land, we prefer the single quote or the apostrophes here for text. Um, there, there's reasons and we'll get to it. It's okay. So I'll say print, start a parenthesis, start a set of quotes or apostrophes here, and I'll say hello world. That's it. That is our Python program to print hello world to the screen. So then I'm going to, you can either use the run button up here, or you can right click and say run, or you can go to the run menu and say run. There's like 50 different ways to do everything. I mean, at least three different ways to do everything. So uh, that's how we're going to do it. So either one of those, perfectly fine. I'm fond of right-click run myself. That's just what I like to do. And now I'll see I get a new tab open down here, a new section in PyCharm. This is the output section here. So it's telling me, hey, it's actually running this thing, the Python executable, and it's saying, please run this script. And we'll get more into what Python actually does uh, next week and, and what all this means behind the scenes. But essentially, I could redo this command myself if I want it in another terminal window or command prompt or PowerShell window. And I'll see my output. So anything I put in here will show up down here in my output. So I could do another print if I wanted. We'll say, hello, computer. Happy Thursday. And then I'm going to right-click run. And I wish I get both lines hello world and hello computer happy thursday and maybe the computer talks to me maybe it says hello human nice to meet you i'm a, a very excitable person i drink all sorts of coffee so everything has an exclamation mark in this program here we are very excited and we just had a silly little pretend conversation with our computer that was it now what i'm going to do so my code is saved locally. I have my computer as a copy of it, but if something happens to my computer, if my toddler gets up here again, spills my cup of coffee all over it and fries my laptop again, I'll be really sad. Uh, but if my code is committed and pushed to synchronize with github.com, the code won't get lost. Github.com sells this service to organizations who write code professionally, like all sorts of organizations who have developers who write code for them so that they have that central location, plus all their cool collaboration tools and whatnot. But if our code is in github.com, we can't lose it, essentially. So you notice this idea file changed. We don't care. Just let that idea file change. I'm going to look at this Hello World main PY. So it says, hey, these lines here were removed. Red means gone, or the, the little um, minus mark here means they were gone, if you're colorblind. And a little plus mark here, or green, means these lines were added. Great, this is perfect. So I'm going to say, um, it says, hello world complete for my message i'll click commit it takes a snapshot of all of the files at that point in time tracks it and then i push so i'm going to encourage you to commit early and often because commits are free there's no cost to make a commit there's no cost to sync it with github.com except for like the electricity cost for everything that has to happen behind the scenes but essentially no cost we're not going to worry too much about that and then if github.com has your code you can't lose it just fantastic and then once you have a commit, it's almost impossible to lose it. Um, in, in terms, like if you go change something again, and you want to get back to where you were, you can almost always get back to a previous commit, which is really cool because you have that snapshot. It says here's what everything looked like at this point in time. So we can always go backwards. Now it's technically possible to screw that up, but it's really frowned upon. And there's commands that you can do in the Git program that will let you do that, uh, but we, we frown upon that sort of thing in the developer world. We, we don't want people to erase the commit history, essentially. Um, just leave it there. It's all good. So I'll come back to my main PY here, and I'll hit refresh. And I should see, oh, hey, here's my lines. Now, one other cool thing, and I think we'll probably call it a day, is that Git is tracking at the line level. So I'm going to print here. I'm going to say, uh, hi, this is Eric. Okay, and I'll save and run, make sure it runs here. And now I see, hi, this is Eric. Now, if I come back to my GitHub client, again, the workspace file changes, just leave it alone, it's fine. I see here, this is old line numbers on the left, this is new line numbers on the right. 
at this line, the only difference in the file was this line was inserted right here. So it's tracking all my changes at the line level. So as our programs get bigger and bigger and bigger and larger and larger and larger, and we have 100, 200, 300 lines of code, we can see, oh, you added something at line 14, or you added line, something at line 27, or you deleted what used to be line 39, right? And then you're able to track it at that level of detail. It's fantastic. So hi, Eric. Will be my commit summary. I'll give it a commit and hit push. All of that code will go out here to github.com. I can refresh. So if you can see it on github.com, I can see it on github.com. That's why we like this tool. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. All right. So I think we're good for a course introduction. Again, next week, and we don't have lab on Monday. Happy Labor Day. We're going to meet for lecture Tuesday and Thursday. Same time, same place, twitch.tv slash Eric Janeski. Or if you'd like to watch them asynchronously, uh, technically they are available on Twitch as well. Uh, but they only last for about 45 days. So I export everything over to my YouTube channel. You can go take a look at them at YouTube. And out here in Canvas, I'm going to add a new module here. See if I can work Canvas. Add a module. I'm going to call this the Lecture Archive. So all the YouTube videos are going to be added out in this module here. Make sure I hit that Publish button here. And I'll add links for all of them once I have them done. I, it's not exported yet, I'll export it in just a minute here. So this will be 2021-09-02 course intro. And then as soon as that's done exporting um, out to YouTube, I'll put the YouTube link in here. You're welcome to view it there as well. All right, uh, so it was nice meeting all of you here in chat at least uh, saying hi. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm gonna send you a link as well um, so that, um, you know, it probably doesn't even matter. So if you want to meet uh, for my office hours, um, just I'm going to do them by appointment. I'm available a lot of times, but not all the time. Um, typically not early in the morning, but usually late at night. Uh, I used to do meetings um, relatively often after my kids went to bed, especially in the pandemic. I did a lot of meetings after 9 p.m. And that worked out really well for some people who are late people like me. If you're an early morning person, uh, maybe I can catch you like afternoons or something. Uh, but typically I'm busy around dinner time. I like to, to get a break from away from all this stuff and go have dinner, do stuff with the kids until they go to bed. Uh, so like between 5 and 8 p.m., 5 and 9 p.m. is generally bad. Other than that, I'm relatively flexible. So let me know what I can do if you want to meet up and chat for office hours. Um, I like just talking general tech. I like memes. Um, I like talking about programming. Anything that's on your mind, oh, we can chat about. Or anything about the course. Right? Uh, my goal here is to help you learn the material. Um, the, the more we we've actually understand how learning happens and how education happens, I don't want to pretend that I'm teaching you, right? The, the, what's happening is you folks are learning it. I'm giving you examples. I'm going, I'm answering questions, right? I'm showing you some, some things that aren't in the book because that way you have the book to reference that has its own set of examples. I'll give you a different set of examples. So you can see it two, three different times in different ways to help you learn the material. So if you're not sure about something, please reach out and ask. Uh, I'm, I'm very informal. Uh, I'm not going to get upset that you're asking me questions. Like that, that's literally why I'm paid to teach here, so that I can answer your questions and help you learn the material. Right? Um, if, if they just wanted someone to stand up here and talk, they could just give you my YouTube videos. Right? I mean, I actually have them out from last last year. If you're so bored and want to work ahead, you could check out those YouTube videos. Um, but I'm, I'm here to do this. Um, it, it, I like doing it live and letting people ask questions during lecture. I think that it generally works better. That's my particular learning style. I'm not good with the whole asynchronous model myself, uh, but if it works well for you, great. Um, watch the videos asynchronously, shoot me questions, and I should get back to you relatively quick. Um, let me actually cancel this. I missed the one thing, my profile here. Uh, you folks can read, I'm sure. Uh, but if you want to take a look and see, uh, again, I've got my contact info down here on Discord, by email, by cell phone, call or text. Let me know what I can do to help. Did the pictures not come through? My pictures didn't come through. They, they, they looked fine in edit mode. I don't know what I did. My goodness. It's a picture of all the games right here over my shoulder. Um, that's my whole bookshelf there. Okay, that's fine. No big deal. Anyway, uh, so I'll post that link as soon as I export this out to YouTube, and we'll go from there. So I'll see you folks next Tuesday. Um, and because we are in Twitch land, we should go send a raid out to somebody. Uh, that's part of the, the fun of Twitch. We can go pester someone else's channel. Let me see. I've got some other friends out here. Uh, if you In chat, if you do exclamation TKF, that's a, an acronym for the Knowledge Fellowship. It's a bunch of educational-focused streamers, not necessarily college lectures or anything like that, but just anybody who wants to share their knowledge 
out on Twitter. Uh, we got a whole Twitch. My goodness, too many T's. Uh, we got a whole group of folks who like doing that sort of thing. Uh, so I like sending raids out that way so you can, guys can learn other things from other channels. Uh, let's see who's online here. Come on, friends. I don't know if anyone's online right now. It's not showing me the page. Hang on. If I turn off the screen share, it usually runs a little better. Let me go to stream ending. There. Hopefully that'll load a little better now. I was not trying to do a screen capture. Let's see. Wow, oh, yeah, we got a lot of people around. Nice. So let's go take a look at notes and volts. Uh, they're a lot of fun here. Um, just some fun things. Again, it's totally optional, just a fun Twitch thing. Uh, if you want to go over there and say hi, we'll raid that channel. And we can go from there. All right, if not, I'll see you folks on Tuesday for lecture. Uh, we'll do Tuesday, Thursday. And then we'll finally have our in-person lab a week from Monday. We can go from there. All right, folks, you take care. I'll see you around. Transgressive pornography. I've ever clapped eyes on.